Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ETHUB weekly recap. On these episodes, we discuss the ETHUB weekly newsletter, which covers news from the Ethereum ecosystem and crypto space as a whole. This week, we cover the news from March 25th to March 31st. Hey, Anthony, you want to walk us through the news? Hey, Eric, sure. So a couple of uh, ETHUB Oh, well, one Ethub related announcement uh, this week. So uh, you put out a tweet earlier in the week announcing a new kind of initiative around a, a new community call and forum. And this kind of came about because of all the, obviously, all the prog power chat we've been seeing lately and people not knowing how to measure community sentiment of what who wants what. And then there's just all this discussion happening and no action. And then, you know, we had all the discussion from the core devs as well saying that it's too noisy for them. They don't know, you know, who to side with or, or who to listen to. Um, the core devs should be focused obviously on technical things uh, and they shouldn't have to get into the weeds of trying to measure community sentiment and things like that. That should be able to be fed up to them. Now, this is obviously a problem that's, you know, plaguing every kind of decentralized blockchain where it's very hard to gauge sentiment. Like, of course, Bitcoin being the obvious example of that. Uh, they split, you know, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Split because of the uh, inability to reach consensus on a kind of a, a block size increase. Uh, and, you know, we're so, seeing re- a kind of, I guess, a bit of a mirroring of that with Ethereum. I don't think there's any split on the table, but, you know, ProgPow is coming a, becoming a lot more contentious than it needs to be. So, you know, we, we had this idea of a community call where we could have a bunch of people that have been kind of heavily involved within the Ethereum community for quite a while, you know, provide value, whether that be through you know, blog posts, participating on forums, on Reddit, on Twitter, anything like that, basically, basically any level of involvement, but kind of heavily involved around basically, you know, for, for a while, maybe, you know, one to two years or something like that, uh, and getting them on, onto a call and discussing all these kind of important issues and trying to formalize something to pass up to the to the core devs because at the moment it's really rough and you know it's very hard to gauge the sentiment uh so yeah we're 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 kind of in the very early stages of kind of specking this out and seeing how we want to go about it we've got like the um kind of proof of concept forum up on community.ethub.io the forum's going to be open to everyone um it's just going to require a twitter login uh we will be moderating it to get rid of the trolls and things like that and and spam but we're not going to be kind of locking anyone out so even if Bitcoiners want to come on there and start questioning things, they're free to do so uh, as long as they're doing it in good faith and they're not trying to, uh, you know, spread misinformation and things like that. Uh, And the community call will be, uh, you know, a select group of people. We don't know how we're going to select the people yet. Uh, We might put it to a vote or, or, you know, it's still very early days. We don't actually know how we're going to do it, but we do want the call to be a limited number of people because if you start letting anyone join the call, it gets too noisy and it's very hard to communicate uh, or kind of coordinate a call like that. Uh, but you, you you kind of thought about this first, Eric. So did you want to walk through a bit of your thinking around this as well? Yeah, I mean, you gave a really good recap of it and, and where we're headed. I mean, it just seemed obvious. I mean, for the first few years in Ethereum, everything was pretty technical on the decision side. And, it, you know, now it seems like there's some other kind of stakeholders, I guess we'll put it, that want to say. Um, and also, I'll, I'll note that, like, I've heard from a lot of the core devs, like, they don't want to be resp- the only ones responsible for some of this decision making. So, you know, I don't think, I guess we don't really know what it's going to turn into. I hope that it just turns into kind of like a, another signal that people can use if something's controversial. I don't think it necessarily needs to be used for every decision that's made, right? Like to me, there's very obvious things such as say prog power, issuance reductions, things like that, that we probably need some signals outside of just the core devs call. So, you know, we'll experiment on our own. I'm sure some others might, might do some stuff, but yeah, I guess people want to keep up to um, date on what we're thinking about just obviously per usual our twitters but yeah as you mentioned community.ethub.io is where the forum is going to live and it'll be kind of interesting to how we select who joins the call but like obviously we need to filter it down a little bit right our goal there is 
for people. To, it, pretty much what I'm thinking is somehow the best representation for the discussions that happen on the forum, make it into the call just to make it concise. And it's like probably just once a month is all that's necessary. Um, and yeah. And if, if the core devs are like, hey, that clear, there's some contention over this issue, we should go look at other parts of the community and see what they think. That's where I think this could become valuable. Yeah, exactly. And as I said, we're still early days. So if you've got feedback for us, definitely hit us up on Twitter. Uh, we're going to be formalizing a lot of our thinking around this, putting out a blog post relatively soon. Uh, we're hoping to get this, you know, stood up as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so yeah, just keep an eye on Twitters. Uh, and one other thing, another big part of news this week was ETH2 test nets. So we have Status releasing their Nimbus client uh, this week, and we have Prylabs and Sigma releasing theirs very soon. Now, this is awesome. Uh, we've been speaking about how test nets were coming over the last few weeks, and we finally got the first one out in production. I know that a few people in the ETH community have posted on Twitter saying they're running them. Uh, Vitalik posted as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to get mine set up on the weekend. Uh, I know you've, I think you set it up as well, Eric. But yeah, it's happening. It's finally here. We've got testnet clients. We can start, you know, testing things, um, doing benchmarks, getting hardware requirements, which has been a huge question. And we're also going to be documenting all of this on Ether. We're going to have a dedicated page to kind of hardware requirements and networking requirements and different benchmarks from different client, uh, different client implementations. So yeah, it's it's good to see these things finally come to life because it's been I think it's been about nine months since the phase zero spec started because uh, uh, the original Casper and sharding work were merged uh, and you know it, it's been a quite a quick turnaround. So we're on track I think for end of year kind of mainnet as long as there's no critical problems with the test nets. Uh, so yeah, it's it's happy April I guess. <laughs> Awesome. So on to the news now. Uh, just one bit of news I wanted to talk about this week. Uh, another exchange hack. So BitHum got hacked again. I think this is the third time they've been hacked, which is quite embarrassing for them. Uh, I think they're the most popular exchange in South Korea uh, at the moment, uh, at least by trading volume. So basically what happened was there was $13 million worth of EOS stolen. Uh, it's suspected that it was an inside job, of course. Um I think there was some, some XRP as well uh, from that. But yeah, so I made a joke on Twitter about how, you know, when are the EOS block producers going to reverse this transaction? But apparently the people who stole the EOS were dumping it quite fast on on other exchanges. So I'm not sure. I haven't seen a post-mortem about it just yet. But yeah, it's quite embarrassing that this kind of exchange, it isn't a small exchange, has been, you know, hacked yet again, especially via inside job, which, you know, is quite ridiculous considering... You know, these exchanges normally have kind of setups with multi-sigs and things like that. So these inside jobs uh, have a very low chance of happening. Uh, but, you know, without the details, we can only speculate. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, this obviously paints the picture of decentralized exchanges being needed more and more. Uh, we'll speak about this a lot, but, you know, they're still not ready uh, yet because of uh, liquidity issues and, and scaling issues. But uh, we did talk about um, Starkware last week, Starkdex, how they're making great strides there. So scalability seems like it'll be solved uh, and liquidity, you know, it's, it depends. I think liquidity is going to be something that we see uh, evolve over time. There's a lot of people trying to focus on it, but I think it's just a bear market symptom. I think in a bull market, we're going to see a lot more liquidity come into the market, especially if these decentralized exchanges are scalable. Uh, and then these, you know, the everyday traders will want to use these and it won't be expensive for them to use either. Yeah, I mean, I'm scared to even send any crypto to a, to an exchange these days. I don't really do any trading or anything anymore, so I pretty much avoid at all costs. But I mean, even like a Coinbase or Gemini, which I would relatively trust, I would feel like mm, dirty just keeping it there for more than a couple of minutes just because I feel like at any moment it could be stolen. I mean, yeah, we, we talk a lot, like you mentioned Stark Dex. I, I think these scaling solutions are coming and you know we at some point we're going to go through another bull run and i think a lot of these ex, uh, exchange hacks in the last like year or two have been i mean people have lost money i guess the one in canada was pretty large but i you just know like a really big one that's going to affect bitcoin and ether or something like that is going to happen and if you kind of have these scaling solutions lined up for decentralized exchanges at the same time that's probably going to be the catalyst that happens you know i think we'll see a small movement over um as these 
scaling solutions come on. But then if you have another like really big exchange hack, you're, I'm talking like the Bitfinex one back in 2015, where a very large amount of Bitcoin got stolen, or even Gox style, right, where there's a huge portion of Bitcoin stolen. Like, I think it's going to have to be, and you, you just know it's going to happen, right? Like, obviously, a lot of these exchanges are running shops, basically, it sounds like out of their garage, which with not much uh, OPSEC at all. But I think it's going to be a combination of scaling and then a large hack that's going to, at that point, you could kind of see the floodgates open, I think, for decentralized exchange popularity. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, about how the exchanges hold a lot of crypto. Like, we, I know for a fact that Coinbase holds 25% of all Litecoin, 8% of all ETH, and 5% of all Bitcoin, which is quite ridiculous when, when you think about it, right? I mean, I know Coinbase has, I think, I mean, I've seen their security setup. I think it's best in class. They definitely need to have a best in class setup because they're offering, offering custody solutions now. Uh, so it would be very interesting if they ever got hacked because they like I've seen the links that they go to. There was a blog post published a while ago, but I've seen the, the links that they go to using kind of Faraday tents and cages and, you know, just only using a laptop that's never connected to the internet to generate private keys for uh, offline kind of um, storage and, and splitting the keys and all this kind of fancy OPSEC stuff. Uh, so I'd be very surprised if a, you know, an exchange like Coinbase their cold storage was ever hacked uh, because that would kind of cast doubt over, I think, basically every kind of custody solution. Because if Coinbase can't do it, then how can we trust anyone to do it? Coinbase has arguably been in it for kind of the most amount of time like and, and still around because obviously we had Gox that's that's older, but Gox is, 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 has been gone for a few years now, but Coinbase is still around. Uh, to my knowledge, they've never suffered, suffered a hack of their cold storage so yeah, I think it definitely depends on reputation and kind of how long that these exchanges have been around. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think Dexes still have their place, of course, uh, and Coinbase is its own beast. It's more like a bank than an exchange these days, anyway. Yeah, the other interesting thing too is like all the exchanges are kind of stepping their fees up, right? Like Coinbase had um, they for a while they had maker fees were zero, and they just added. Uh, ma not maker the coin but like trading if you're a maker and you put an order on a book instead of take one like they had free fees for that and now they don't so that'll be interesting too because if we're talking like something like stark decks when i talk to those guys like the fees are very small for that so beyond just custody like if we can start to get speed and lower fees on dexes too like then you're really starting to talk right like if you can knock all three of those out of the park then you're really going to start to see the stampede yeah, fees are definitely a big thing. Not sure if Coinbase has just uh, kind of raised their fees due to the bear market. I'm sure that they'll have some like kind of promotional things that they do, uh, you know, down the line, especially in a bull market where they lower fees. But yeah, I definitely think that decentralized exchanges can get to that point where they're both performant and cheaper, uh, you know, than they are now. And maybe one day they get to a point where they're cheaper and more performant than centralized exchanges. <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, there is all types of types of uh, magic technology coming out like stocks that might be able to uh you know achieve that kind of scalability yeah for sure cool cool so next project updates what's new in eth2 this week i think we missed this one last week ben was kind of busy but he put out a longer edition this week to make up for it so it was called the taking stock edition so he kind of reviewed what's been going on in eth2 over the last nine months as i mentioned before nine months ago the old casper and sharding designs were scrapped and then kind of merged into this what we have today, ETH2 kind of beacon chain spec. Uh, the phase zero spec was nothing nine months ago. Now it's fully fleshed out. You can see all the details in the in the uh, the post. Uh, it's quite amazing to see how fast it all moved. Uh, you know, Ben goes through phase zero, the beacon chain, how it's basically, the spec's basically complete. And now obviously we have test nets, as I mentioned before. Then he talks about phase one is starting to ramp up now. Uh, and then phase two, which is kind of, still very much non-existent. The spec document doesn't exist yet. It's it's just scattered in research posts and things like that. Uh, but it's good to see phase one picking up already, considering that we've got the test net for phase zero out already. So when we have mainnet by the end of the year, hopefully, then phase one can launch next year and then phase two the year after it. And kind of phase two is the main, like anything after phase two is kind of very, very experimental and, and you know, not critical to the success because phase two gives us the state an execution layer, which basically puts it on feature parity with ETH1 today with all the improvements such as, you know, sharding for scalability and proof of stake and things like that. 
Uh, so yeah, I definitely recommend giving it a read. There's a lot packed in here. Uh, he also gives a nice shout out to our podcast with Vitalik, which was nice to see. So thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, so go have a read of that. But yeah, what did you think of this, Eric? Yeah, I mean, we talk about Ben in, the, in this. He does a great job with this. So, and I appreciate the shout out for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy how it's almost like what isn't new <laughs> to these days. I feel like it's so hard to keep up. Like everyone's kind of obsessed right now for whatever reason with prog pow and all this stuff. But like, meanwhile, the E2 teams just have had their heads down, just pumping out um, the specs and the releases and now the test nets. I mean, one of my favorite things about the E2 teams is like how transparent they are into their processes. Like you can really, they all put out pretty much, I think like bi-weekly development updates and you, like their GitHubs are really active and they all have channels you can join on discord or telegram. And there's a lot of transparency into it. And I mean, if you're actually trying to follow it, I mean, if you're someone out there that's just constantly poo-pooing E2.0, it's easy to say, Oh, it, no one even knows what's going on with E2. Like, who knows what's even happening here? Some of my favorite uh, hedge fund managers out there like to say that stuff. But if you're actually like engaging and trying to follow this stuff, it, there's a lot happening. And it's really cool to see the test nets come online. And when Vitalik was on the podcast, he basically said, Yeah, they're coming very, very soon. And lo and behold, Status released it a few days ago. And I was running that on, on my Mac. And it, it's pretty awesome to see it all starting to come together. So, yeah, I mean, like you were saying, it, it's just crazy how fast it's moved and how much is happening. It, it's, it's hard to keep up, but I, I just, I guess in wrapping this up, I want to give a big shout out to all the E2 teams and how not even how awesome you guys are, but like the transparency into the process and being able to follow along everything. I think they've done a great job with that. Yeah, definitely second that. Um, I, I know I've spoken personally to some of the teams and they're very, very responsive whenever I have questions, especially for ETH Hub. Obviously, we want to get everything onto ETH Hub, which, you know, quick shout out. We've got the review revised ETH2 uh, page going up soon. I'm just putting the final touches on it. We had someone complete the bounty for that, which is really cool. Uh, so that's going to have uh, a lot of the extra details in there. We've got up to phase two, of course, and then we've got links to check out the other three phases that are currently spec'd, uh, not spec'd out, but kind of in research phase. And we'll keep that updated as much as possible. We've also got a new updated ETH1.x page that should be live by the time this podcast goes out. Uh, that was completed by the same person that's doing the ETH2 page for us. So yeah, he earned about 250 die for for his work, which is uh, through Gitcoin, which is really awesome. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be putting more bounties out. That were the only two we had live so far, but we're going to be putting a lot more out. We've got a whole spreadsheet of things we want to get on there. So keep an eye on the ETH Hub Twitter for that. Uh, and you know, speaking of Gitcoin, you know, it's a perfect segue into my next uh, update. So Gitcoin this week introduced a platform fee. So this is really interesting to see. So they, intro uh, they introduced a 10% fee for uh, people who post issues on Gitcoin. Now, I think this was received quite positively from the comments you know I've seen on Twitter because people are always wondering how are these crypto native businesses going to make money. And a lot of them haven't really thought about this. Some of the, obviously the token projects are like, oh, well, our token will appreciate if you know our product's successful. And you know, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Nick Carter put out a tweet thread about this. Uh, it's on, uh, I think it's in the newsletter. I'm pretty sure I linked it in the newsletter. Uh, so he put out a tweet thread about value accrual and ICOs and tokens and all that. And he used MasterCoin as the perfect example of how uh, MasterCoin, which is now Omni, houses or is home to Tether. And Tether has like a two, $3 billion market cap and MasterCoin is nowhere near that. I think it's like less than 100 million or something or, or um, Omni or whatever it was called. Uh, so obviously the base layer uh, chain, the coin of the base layer hasn't accrued much value. So what's to say your token won't accrue much value even if your project is wildly successful? Uh, we've spoken about token economics before on the podcast, especially around governance tokens like 0x and Maker. Uh, you know, Maker's done quite well and so is 0x if you compare it to ICO price. But if you're talking about a long-term kind of value accrual, you're going to need more than relying on just your token price to run a viable business, I think. And it's great to see Gitcoin doing this, even though Gitcoin doesn't have a token Obviously, they can't rely on that since they, you know, obviously don't have one. But you know, they they did the the platform fee for ongoing sustainability. And Gitcoin obviously uh, provides a great service to the community. The Gitcoin Grants program is awesome. Uh, shout out to everyone that's that's donated to us. We actually got a big donation uh, this week from someone uh, for fifteen hundred die. So thank you very much to that person for for donating to us. But yeah, on grants you can donate to to so many different people on there. 
uh, and you know, without Gitcoin spearheading this, we we wouldn't have that. So I'm 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 pleased to see that they're thinking about their sustainability going forward and not just relying on the goodwill of the community. I guess. Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, Gitcoin, like you said, one of my favorite projects out there. And it's funny when Kevin was on the podcast, he was saying like how tempting it really was to consider an ICO at the time um, when because of obviously Gitcoin was kind of launching during all the ICO madness um, and he turned it down. He, he did like not really close the door on a potential future token for Gitcoin. So it seems like they're starting to explore some profitability models. I, I'm all for these apps trying trying things like this, right? I mean, I use the example of Ether Delta. Was there, so I guess stepping back a little bit, the counter I always see to this is, oh, it's an open source product. If you put a fee in there, people are just going to fork it and take the fee out. That was a fear like I even had early on we had with EtherX when we were trying it um, because we were trying to come up with business models and everyone was like, oh, if you put anything in, they're going to fork it out. Um, I do think people will eventually fork out tokens that are truly useless. I'm not convinced putting a small fee into your business is going to be forked out because network effect is very important, right? At this point, Gitcoin has the network effect when it comes to their business. Um and we want these businesses to be sustainable, especially if they didn't go through an ICO, right? Like we want them to try other things. Like we can't trash ICOs and then trash them for trying to make money in other ways. Uh, so I think putting a little fee in here, and I'll go back to Ether Delta. Like they lived with a 0.3% trading fee for like a year and a half. And that was a very, very easily open source forkable product and no one did it and they made mil- uh, over a million dollars in fees I, I i dug into the contract account once and they were making a lot of money off of fees so you know people aren't going to go in there and just fork this out so i'm totally open to products that need to some kind of monetization to happen to expand to try this so 10 percent sounds like a lot but really it's probably not in the long run and we're, uh, the other things we're kind of seeing are I think we're going to see are starting to charge for like pro features like maybe Uniswap could offer like for a pro side of their trading book like digging into um, stats and all that stuff so I think we're going to start to see these experiments happen and I'm all for it yeah exactly uh, it, it's interesting you talk about forking out tokens and things like that obviously we saw Uniswap it didn't fork out the Bancor token it just recreated kind of the Bancor model and started from a, a fresh new project so it's not kind of a one to one comparison uh, but it does work sometimes right uh, but most of the time you can't you can fork the code you can fork everything but you can't really fork the state and by that you can't fork the community uh, you can't fork the, the funds that are already locked so if you were to f- kind of fork make a DAO today you're not You'd fork the contracts and everything, but you're not forking the over two million ETH that's locked up in the MakerDAO contracts. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? So uh, it's important to remember that because someone can obviously fork Gitcoin or whatever right now and stand up their own without the fee. But I mean, is anyone going to use it? Probably not because it's a copycat platform. It's probably got people that don't understand it very well compared to the Gitcoin team who created it uh, and all these sorts of things. So I think that uh, forking out a token uh works sometimes doesn't work all the time uh unless the token is pro is kind of uh really cumbersome for the platform so if you actually need the token to interact with the platform i can imagine if you actually needed zero x to use a relayer that would be forked out straight away you know what i mean like no one would use that and and zero x would would be you know wouldn't be as popular as as it is today same with maker you do need tokens when paying down fees like you need some some maker tokens uh, but other than that, you don't need it to do anything else really, uh, except if you want to participate in voting, but that's separate to taking out a CDP and, and, uh, drawing some die. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what other kind of business models people come up with for the different apps, because monetization in open source software can be hard because as you said, forkability and things like that, but I don't think, uh, you know, it has to be hard. I think if done right, these companies can make a lot of money. Yeah, definitely. I, I think we're going to see, you know, especially as they start to gain network effect and try this out. I, I think there's money to definitely be made. We just haven't seen these models explored yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, and speaking of Maker, they put out an update this week about multicollateral die. So this is quite a big update, actually. They kind of gave a high level overview of multicollateral die, and they gave us a sneak peek of the multicollateral die CDP uh, portal, which is really cool to see. It's just a GIF going through it. I posted it on Twitter. It's in the blog post, which you can find in the newsletter anyway. 
Uh, and you can also play with the contracts on Coban, the Coban testnet now, which is really cool. No kind of release dates around multilateral DAI yet in this blog post, but it's good to see that they're getting closer. Uh, you know, DAI and Maker are always in the news. We speak about it probably every week on this podcast. We spoke about last week how Justin Drake put out a tweet thread um, kind of... Uh, I don't know, taking like the uh, contrary or devil's advocate approach to Maker, saying that he thinks multi-collateral die is too complex and uh, a single collateral die could work if you and you could even just fork out the Maker token and, and make it work like that. You know, maybe that happens. Maybe we live in a world where multi-collateral die gets deployed and then people maybe don't, you know, want to be part of that and someone forks the single collateral die contracts and people start using that just like, uh, you know, Uniswap basically without a without a token or anything, and it becomes its own thing. I, you know, I actually fully expect something like that to happen, to be honest, because it's just too obvious for it not to. Uh, because single collateral die has worked very, very well up until now. Obviously, the pegs being kind of a bit loose there, but there are other levers that can be pulled, uh, you know, to, to kind of save the peg. Uh, you know, we'll see it. We'll see what happens. The the die might be different as well, because in single collateral, it won't be maker's die. It'll be like a different die. It gets a bit messy when you think about it, but you know, I'm very curious to see what happens there. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how multi-collateral die plays out. I mean, we had Rune, the CEO and founder of Maker on the podcast last week, and we talked a lot about this. I mean, I definitely have some concerns about around the risk governance of this, but you know, hope, I think to push open finance to the next level, I'm hoping that things like multi-collateral die can work, right? Because we really need to open up other collateral types and options and kind of more riskier loans. Obviously, we'll really get there with like identity and reputation, but this will at least allow kind of like a different set or array of interest rates and collateral types, which will be cool to see. I do think potentially people will get burned on some bad risk governance and, and less liquid tokens, but that's fine. I mean, there's definitely kind of a, if you're going into this, you probably know what you're getting into. Um, the most exciting part about multi-collateral die though, is to me, at least the die savings rate, which kind of finally balances that supply and demand side of um, die stability. Right now we kind of just have the stability fee to play with. And we've seen that's kind of been a roller coaster of emotions in the last few weeks. Like we raised it to, or they raised it to three and a half and then seven and a half. And it's still kind of floating underneath one. So I think we really need to get this multi-collateral die system online to really kind of not only see like the full of what maker can do, but also to make sure that die peg stays closer to one. Yeah, it's all an experiment at the end of the day. So we'll see how this plays out. Uh, hopefully, the die returns to $1 before multi-collateral die comes out. I think it will because I don't expect uh, multi-collateral for it to come out for a few months still. Uh, and I think that another stability fee rise will be on the table very soon considering that die is hovering around $0.96, $0.97 cents still, uh, which might annoy even more people. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Cool, cool. So the next thing I want to talk about was the US stock index token uh, was released by UMA protocol this week. So this was announced a few weeks ago. UMA was announced a few weeks ago uh, and they announced uh, released their first product. So it's an ERC-20 token it rep and it represents a synthetic ownership of an index of the 500 largest exchange listed US stocks. Now that's a mouth mouthful, but basically it means that anyone uh, can now participate in the US stock market. So anyone with an internet connection and an Ethereum wallet, which is, you know, most of the world has access to that at this point. Uh, and you can basically trade these synthetic assets, which is really cool to see. Uh, it's instantly interoperable with basically everything on Ethereum, considering it's uh, adhering to the ERC-20 token standard. Uh, and yeah, it's just basically what we've been talking about with this whole kind of DeFi and open finance movement and a lot of this interoperability going on between these different assets. Uh, you know, I think a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months now, we spoke about that exchange that went live that was allowing you to trade kind of representations of different stocks. Uh, that's very different to this. This is, uh, I think this is more than a representation. I'm not an expert on synthetic assets, but uh, you know, it's, it's it's a different implementation of it. You'll be able, to, it's an ESA 20 token, so you'll be able to move it around wherever you please. Uh, so yeah, what did you think of this one, Eric? Yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped for this. I mean, we've talked a lot about kind of trading stocks via ERC 20s in the past. I mean, if I'm being completely blunt, I'm kind of tired of the whole lending and borrowing side of DeFi. Like that's just one aspect, right, of finance and where we can go here. Um, 
super pumped for eventually being able to trade stocks as ERC twenties. I, I think that's going to become a reality one day. Like the benefits are just there. Like we've talked about twenty four seven trading and like instant global reach and just kind of true ownership and security around your stock and custody of it. I think we're going to get there. So these kind of smaller stepping to stones with like this UMA token, which like you mentioned, kind of represents this index of the S and P five hundred. Um, you know, this is a good start. Like, I'm sure this isn't, I don't know, like how on the legal and regulation side, if we're quite there yet, but you know, that companies like an E-Trade or Fidelity or some of these stock custody solutions, um, or even maybe down, I know NASDAQ's been interested in Ethereum in the past. So uh, it just seems completely inevitable to me that stocks are eventually going to be traded using something like an ERC 20. So I'm, I'm, pumped to see kind of this these strides be taken I, i'm really excited and beyond stocks right we've talked about tokenizing real estate and things like that like uh i really want to see these real world assets come on the chain and so it's anytime we see news like this i think it's great yeah exactly uh i definitely think it's when not if uh, with regards to trading stocks as ESA 20 tokens it's just there's so many obvious benefits that it's just it's a matter of time basically Cool. So on to the on-chain activity for the week. Uh, it was really cool to see you put out a tweet this week, Eric, about the Ethereum uh, active addresses were starting to rise again, and they kind of decoupled from price. Now, you put this tweet out a few days ago, and of course, today we saw uh, this. We're recording this on them on a Monday, uh, Monday night. Uh, we saw the price of Bitcoin spike pretty heavily, I think, to like almost 5,000, uh, and ETH spiked as well because of that. But it was kind of cool to see that the price had decoupled from active addresses, which means there's more network activity happening. Uh, and now the price has kind of followed, <laughs> which is, I don't know whether that was, um, you know, it correlates one to one, but it was just a really uh, curious timing. So, but yeah, it was, it was your tweet. So you, you walk us through basically your, your thinking around that. Yeah, I guess a little background. I'm a big fan of thinking that network activity leads to price. And it, so I guess for a short shout out to Coinmetrics, because they kind of been able, like, really quickly being able to generate graphs that kind of represent um, network utility and usage and price. So I was looking at, and actually I look at this graph a lot, and I just haven't really shared it too much in the past publicly, but active addresses. I look, I like looking at transactions, mainly for Bitcoin. Transactions on Ethereum is a little misleading because actually like gas used is more important. Um, so like the historical transaction chart for Ethereum is a bit misleading in the last, I would say, year because it looks like it's going down, but actually network utilization is flat around like 90%. That's just because transactions have become a little bit more costly on the gas side because people are using dApps over simple sends. But anyways, not to get too far off track here, um, I prefer to use active addresses. So if you think of like the active addresses on Ethereum would be a good indicator of how much it's being used and growing. Um, if you look at it historically, and this is the graph I put out on Twitter, the, at times price lags behind active addresses, but it actually tracks it really well historically. And any time that it lagged, it price lagged behind. So there's a large gap in active addresses in price. It eventually caught up. Um, so it did this, I believe, like in early 2016. And then around early 2017, there was a gap and eventually price caught up and a couple times price overshot usage. Uh, but in general, it tracks it really well until the last year where there's a pretty wide gap. And active addresses had been kind of on the downfall a little bit the last, I guess, six or eight months um, off of the peaks. And a lot of that probably had to do with the ice age. Like it wasn't as easy to get transactions through, but we've seen an uptick from the bottom in the last month or so. And that gap starting to widen. I, I personally fully expect that to close. I mean, I'm not using this to call price rise or saying that ether is going to rise, but I mean, just looking at this historically, and I'm a big believer in activity driving price. I mean, if you look at if the gap were to close, I think it, the graph basically shows that ether should be valued around 400 or 500 or so um I, if someone asked me what i thought the true value of ether should be right now i'd probably say in the three to four hundred levels so um yeah it's just interesting to kind of look at these different graphs and kind of measure network activity versus price and this is one of my favorite to look at and i definitely expect this gap to close at some point 
Yeah, it's it's one of my kind of favorite things to look at as well. Just network activity as a whole uh, on Ethereum, especially as you mentioned, ga- kind of gas usage has remained kind of steady uh, throughout the entire bear market. It actually, grew a lot because people were doing more complex transactions. Uh, you know, especially in the DeFi space, and then uh, active addresses as well spiking up. Uh, there's a lot of different metrics, and as you said, Coin Metrics is a great website to go to, to to see all these various metrics and be able to compare with different networks. You know, there's metrics on inflation, uh, you know, total addresses, kind of all, all that sort of stuff. And and a quick shout out to OnChain FX as well as part of Masari. Uh, it's their kind of uh, uh, crypto market dashboard. They've got a bunch of different uh, stats on there as well. So definitely go check those out. Um, and if you're wondering about how Eric and I kind of, you know, view these, these sorts of things and view the network and view price and things like that, we don't really talk about price too much. But we think about it a lot, like <laughs> a lot, because it's obviously a great indicator of um, a bunch of different things, market sentiment and things like that. And then network activities uh, lets us see that Ethereum is actually growing. It's not just our little echo chamber that, that shows that Ethereum is growing. So, yeah, definitely recommend going to check out those two sites uh, on chain effects and uh, coin metrics and playing around with it a bit. And let us know what you think. Uh, you know, we're happy to help, happy to answer questions. Some of the metrics can get a bit complicated. Uh, but yeah, just reach out on Twitter if you if you need any help with that one. So last thing I wanted to talk about was a awesome tweet thread that Andrew uh, Cyber underscore Hokey put out this week. We've spoken about him uh, in the past. I think he did another tweet thread a while ago. Uh, but he, this one was about explaining the Ethereum improvement uh, proposal, kind of the EIP process. Uh, he has been very active in the prog power debate on Twitter. You might have seen him. Uh, going back and forth with a lot of the the kind of, I guess you'd say thought leaders in this space, like Vlad Zamfia and people like that, uh, going you know back and forth about prog pal, about governance decisions, about how they're made, about how to gauge sentiment, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, in this tweet thread, he went through that he that he kind of fully understands that EIPs are a technical process; they're not meant to kind of take into the social. Uh, aspect of it or, or community sentiment around them they're literally there as a technical kind of uh, upgrade to the protocol that are, are reviewed based on technical merit and nothing got to do with uh you know if it should be implemented or not so obviously prog pal has been reviewed on technical merit uh and it's sound according to a lot of the core developers but the community at large is is more is more concerned about kind of risks and security holes, and that's why there's a whole audit going on at the moment and trying to get money to to get to get the code audited so that there's no backdoors or anything like that, uh, you know. And then that kind of spins off into all the contention around how these uh, things get implemented because to the core devs, this is technically sound. It makes sense to be included because it feel for it, prog power takes uh, theoretically or it should. To kind of take ASICs of the network and Ethereum's always been anti-ASIC. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely recommend going to give that tweet thread a read. It is quite long, but it is very good explanation. Uh, and then also to complement that, there's a blog post uh, that I put in the newsletter as well by Boris Mann. He explains Ethereum's governance and kind of holistically, not just the AIP process, but basically everything. Uh, I've also reached out to him to, he's going to um, hopefully write us up an Ether page about it as well. A bit of more of a condensed version because his blog post is quite long. Uh, but definitely if you're interested in all the Ethereum governance kind of talk and chatter that you've been seeing lately on Twitter, because Twitter's been going off about it for the last few weeks, <laughs> uh, definitely go check out those two, um, you know, and you get a better idea of where people's heads are in this space. Uh so yeah, I know Eric, you've been you've been a bit uh, vocal about uh, Progpal, the kind of contention around it, and all this kind of stuff about governance uh, being more heated because there's it's a bear market. Basically, people are bored; they're kind of finding things to fight about. So, what did you think of kind of Andrew's tweet and even the blog post that Boris put out? Yeah, well, Ether is one fifty now, Bitcoin's five thousand. So I don't know what is Progpal again. I'm not. I'm not even sure. <laughs> yeah, it seems like we've all forgotten about it, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny, like what you focus on during it, like we're in the depths of a bear market, like in Progpo, yes, it's important. Like we're learning a lot of governance lessons here, which to me is why it's important. But in the grand scheme of things, is it the end all be all? No, it's just what everyone's decided to focus on. Uh, But I guess going back to, so Andrew's awesome, highly recommend a, a follow. You said it, but cyber underscore hokey on 
Twitter. I'm assuming that's, I think that's because he went to Virginia Tech, the Hokies, I'm guessing. But uh, anyways, so he did a really good recap of the EIP process. And yeah, it's like, it's not supposed to kind of judge like what we're seeing as far as the prog pow drama goes. Right. And that's kind of why, like we had the idea to do the, this different forum, which we don't have a name yet. If you go on the forum right now, it's just called a theorem users, which is super lame. Although I put out a post like asking for name suggestions and they all sucked so i don't know there were some funny ones but i don't think there are actually ones we can use but we just need more signals out there i mean i think everyone's kind of freaking out that the ethereum governance process is broken and i completely disagree i think to this point it's actually been great like nothing has failed in my opinion to this point it's just that we need some better options to look at whenever the core devs don't want to make these decisions and i know andrew went back and forth a lot with nick johnson who we've also had in the podcast and he's one of my favorite people in the space kind of explaining the eip process and and exactly what it is and what it should be used for and i think you know we're, we're just learning lessons here and there needs to be other stakeholders represented and the core devs, as I mentioned earlier, they don't, they shouldn't be. And I don't think they want to be the end all be all on all of this decision making process. They should just be judging these things on technical merit. Um, and then the, the rest of the community can kind of have their say on like if we should be doing it and why they have concerns or why they like it or whatnot. So um, I, I think this, uh, again uh, to be honest like i if progpod goes in great like i trust the core devs and i do for sure want to see an audit but i'm not going to lose any sleep if progpod goes in right i think if anything we've learned a lot of good lessons from this and anybody out there from another chain that claims they have governance fixed i mean we're recording this on april fool's day so that's probably the best april fool's joke of all like no one has figured this out yet right and it's going to take years to kind of staple down this this process overall yeah i reckon we could do like a few hour kind of podcast on governance and and all the different approaches to it especially with these on-chain governance systems coming online as well uh but we're out of time for today uh so yeah thank you everyone for tuning in again to our podcast uh, if you haven't subscribed yet you can go to ethub.substack.com to check out the newsletter and everything we've talked about and of course subscribe if you haven't uh, and if you want, need to subscribe to the podcast, you can go to podcast.ethub.io. Uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll catch you next week, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at zazzle0x.